So it turns out your car is not designed to run at 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Today, we are going to show you how to diagnose an overheated engine. Story on what happened here. This car was on track in a race. Obviously, oil temps, coolant temps were kind of at their max where they normally sit when you're really driving a car hard. But unfortunately, the car went off track a little bit and it clogged up the front radiator. Uh, if you look over the wheel there, you can see all the grass in there. Unfortunately, when you clog up the radiator, the air isn't moving through there and your coolant temps are going to spike. That's the first thing that happened. Now, the coolant temps spiked. That added a lot of pressure under the system. The coolant started boiling. And when the coolant started boiling, this cap is meant to actually be a pressure release and it released the coolant. And you can see kind of the disbursement of coolant all over the back of this engine as that cap released. Now, immediately the car went into a limp mode and started running on what sounded like three cylinders. It was a very thumpy idle um, when the car came back into the pits. Obviously, we know this car overheated from lack of airflow through the radiator as the grill was clogged up with grass. Now, there's a couple other reasons that could cause an overheat situation, whether it's your water pump not cycling water through the engine quick enough, a thermostat being shut closed, or possibly a pinhole in the radiator or low coolant in the system. Now, a couple of easy ways to identify those is first, just check your coolant gauge. Make sure that your engine isn't overheating via the gauge. Now, another way that is really surefire to make sure that there's enough coolant in the car is by turning your heat on and making sure that air blows hot. If the air does not blow hot, that's gonna show you that there's not enough coolant in the engine and that you may have low coolant and that actually coolant level may be below the temperature sensor, so your gauge may not be picking that up. Now that we know some of the causes of an overheated engine, let's look at the effect and start diagnosing exactly what happened to this engine. First thing I'm going to do is actually just look at the coolant and look at the oil. There's a lot that can be told just by looking at those two fluids, seeing if they mixed at all, seeing if the, the oil looks a little bit like a milkshake, seeing if there's any oil in the coolant. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. We're gonna dig into that right now. So the first thing we kind of need to go over is as the car came back to the pits, the first line of defense was to put some coolant or water into the car to try to cool the engine down. Now you want to be careful about doing that because obviously you can crack the block if you add water too quickly, but most modern cooling systems aren't going to cool water in off the reservoir that quickly. Now, one of the things that was noted when that happened was the water was seemed to be under pressure. There was a little bit of a pulsing from the water. Now that's an indicator that the combustion chamber has been connected to the coolant jacket in the engine at some level probably through the head gasket, but we're not sure. But that's showing that the pressure from the cylinders is actually moving into the cooling system and pressurizing the cooling system. Now we're gonna check into that more in depth later, but the first thing I'm gonna do is just pull the cap on this coolant reservoir, give that a good smell, give it a good visual check, and then we're gonna do the oil right after that. So pulling the pressure cap off, you can see that this is a pressure cap. So at a certain pressure, there's a spring in there that releases and that's what happened when this car overheated. The pressure built up and then actually released and vented the top of this off. Now, looking in there, I'm not seeing any oil residue. It seems pretty clear still. And it still smells a little bit like coolant, but I can tell you there's a faint smell of fuel and combustion. So I can smell a little bit of fuel in there. Now that's giving me an indicator that the combustion chamber, like the pressure, is probably connected somehow into the cooling system. Now, moving over to the oil, what we really want to make sure, and this is more checking the bottom side of the engine, the bearings and, and the crankshaft, we really want to make sure that none of this coolant made it into the oil. So what can happen if you get a oil to coolant basically breach in the head gasket, the coolant will then go into the oil and it will thin the oil and it will make the oil look a little bit like a chocolate milkshake. It'll be really foamy and, and really kind of brown and weird. So we're gonna check the oil and make sure that didn't happen. So looking at the oil, that looks pretty clear. Um, there might be a little bit of foaming on it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull that out again, but it does look pretty clear. So looking at that, I can see through, I can see the metal all the way around. I would, I would bet that the coolant is not into the oil. That looks like pretty clean oil still, you can see. If I did that with a lot of coolant mixed in there, you would probably not be able to see my finger through the oil. In addition to checking the dipstick, we're actually going to check the oil cap. This is a place where the condensation tends to rise to the top of the engine. So even if we don't have any coolant in here, you're probably gonna see it on the bottom of the valve cover. Unfortunately, I don't really wanna pull the valve cover off right now. So the easiest way to check that is actually on this oil cap right here. So I'm looking inside this oil cap and I was looking for any sort of foam or any, any oil residue that looks really foamy and milkshakey. It doesn't really look that way to me. It looks pretty clean and pretty, pretty typical. And now even looking into the valve cover, um, I'm not seeing anything. I actually put my finger in here, 
grab the top. Yeah, this is just regular oil and carbon buildup. This does not look like there's any coolant going around this valve train right now. So now that we've finished up our visual inspection and we've looked at the fluids, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull our coil packs and pull our spark plugs and we're gonna do a compression check on this engine. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to do is get the spark plugs out. When I put it on cylinder number one here, I noticed that this spark plug is actually already loose. Um, so that's an indicator that there might be something going on in this combustion chamber. So we're gonna pull the spark plug out and we're gonna line them all up and make sure we identify and mark what cylinder one, two, three, and four are. The threads still seem fine. Uh, but the spark plug is definitely loose in the combustion chamber. Now looking at it and smelling it, it looks all right. We're gonna compare it to the rest and see what we find. Now you can see that it was loose. Look at all the combustion gases that went up around the seal surface of the spark plug. Uh, so that might have something to do with it. And also looking at this brown here, that might've been some coolant mixed in there. So uh, we might've found something there. We're definitely gonna note that for the future. Now this one is might be a little loose too. So there's a good chance that we have a bit of a failure between, oh, no, I just wasn't, oh, no, I am down. And yep, I'm turning my hand. We could have had an issue um, with, between these two first cylinders. And that's a pretty big issue there. So it looks like the electrode dropped out on this plug. See that? And there's a lot of fuel in there. Fuel that also smells a little bit like water. So not that water smells, but it's definitely not straight fuel, but it smells like combustion. So you can see that the electrode um, isolator or insulator is loose. So I can move it up and down. Uh, so that probably was creating the run issue. But the fact that that plug is pretty wet. Now that could be two things that could be because we have a failure in the combustion chamber into there from the cooling system, or it could be a bunch of unburnt fuel smelling it. It's not super toxic, so I'm guessing it's more of a mixture of water and a little bit of fuel than it is just straight fuel. I'll wipe that off and we're gonna put that over here. Now looking at this, there is some funny business on the, some roughness on the end of that. So we'll have to look into there and make sure nothing fell into the engine, nothing's going on in there. Um, that could simply just be from the steam effect but there's definitely some stuff going on on that plug. Now this plug is dry, looks pretty good. No big issues. Definitely a little bit of combustion gases going up around it um, due to it not being super tight in there, but it looks fine otherwise. And spark plug number four looks pretty good. Um, you know, light brown, kind of the color you want to see them. Doesn't look like any, any big issues there. So it really looks like our problem is in cylinder number two. So before we hook up the compression gauge, we are going to do a visual inspection down each one of these holes. We really want to look down there and make sure there's nothing, no parts, nothing down there um, that could potentially damage the engine more as we crank it over to do the compression check. So looking in here, um, cylinder one seems pretty normal. I can see the top of the piston. Now cylinder two, and cylinder three both have what looks like a little bit of water on top of the piston in the valve cut reliefs. Now that makes me think that we have a head gasket failure between these two cylinders and into the cooling passage that goes between the two. So now looking at cylinder four, it seems pretty dry, maybe a teeny bit of water residue in there, um, but nothing significant compared to what I'm seeing and particularly two and a little bit in three. So I feel pretty comfortable turning this engine over. There's clearly some water in cylinder two and three, but there's no metal, there's no debris in there. Um, the next thing we really want to make sure is that we are not shooting fuel into the engine as we crank this over to do a compression test. Obviously we have the coil packs unplugged, but the injectors will still fire. So we're gonna go pull the fuse that runs the fuel pump and the injectors to make sure we're not squirting fuel into the cylinders. Um, now the last thing is because there is water in two and three pretty clearly, before I actually hook a gauge up, I'm going just to turn the engine over and let it clear out using some of that compressed air. Um, and we're gonna see what comes out of here. If we see a pretty decent spraying of water, it can really kind of help us identify what cylinders are bad and what cylinders are not. All right, so 
Now looking at the cylinders and looking at the spark plugs, we're really seeing a common theme right around the number two cylinder, uh, maybe a little bit into the number three cylinder, but if you look at the spark plugs, it's considerably different than its, than its brothers over here on the either side. And then obviously we had a lot of fluid um, or water in cylinder number two. So all kind of things are pointing to cylinder number two, possibly affecting cylinder three or one, but really the epicenter of the incident seems to be around cylinder number two. Now we're gonna put a compression tester on here and we're gonna find out exactly what those numbers are. What are you, what are you at? Not good. <laughs> well, it's actually, it is good. Like 80? 80? In one. So 80 in one. All right, we're gonna record that. Nothing, huh? Oops, I can hear the sound of it. So cylinder number two. I can just, it didn't even clump. Zero compression. So zero compression. Have some compression there, I can hear it. What are we at? 90. What? 90. 90, okay. Seems like the best one, the biggest thump. So it uh, seems like the only cylinder that wasn't affected by this is cylinder number four, uh, where we got 160 PSI with the throttle plate closed on a cold engine, uh, which is about on par with what we would expect to see from this engine all the way across the board. So that means we were really looking at the first three cylinders with cylinder number two being the epicenter of the problem. Let me write these numbers down and then we're gonna look at a head gasket and really show you what we think is going on inside this engine. So we know right now we have an issue with the epicenter around the number two cylinder. Obviously it's bled into the cooling and it's bled into the number one and two cylinders a little bit. The next step for us is to really get the cylinder head off this so we can get our eyes on this and the engine itself and figure out whether it is a head gasket failure or there's something else wrong with the engine that is making us not have compression on num number two and a little bit less compression on number one and number three cylinders. So let's get this head off this thing and let's figure out what's going on. Now if you are in this process and trying to figure out all the possible head gasket failures you could have, we have linked a video below and that really goes over really in depth all the things a head gasket does and also all the ways they can fail. So check that out in the description below. Now let's get the cylinder head off. So with the result of our diagnosis, as much as we hoped for this to be a simple head gasket job, the fact that we saw zero compression on cylinder number two was alarming. Even with a really blown head gasket, you would expect to see around 10 PSI. Upon further inspection of the fluids of the car, we found oil in both ends of the turbo and intake system, all which were riddled with a little bit of metal flake. Not sure if this is related, the call was made to pull the engine entirely and start to pull things apart. What we found was quite the smoking gun. The cylinder number two piston was melted completely into the ring lands. This justifies the zero compression that we measured on the cylinder. This likely happened from a local overheating of that one cylinder, most likely due to a clogged injector, a bent valve, or a failing head gasket. Here we are a couple days later after tearing apart the mini engine and finding the smoking gun of the melted piston. Now, there's a number of other things you're gonna to wanna to check on your cooling system if you still have an overheated car, even if your compression test came back perfectly fine. Now, one of the ways you can do that is using one of these pressure testers and actually hooking it to your reservoir right here and pressurizing the entire cooling system. This is going to pressurize the expansion tank here as well as the radiator and all the coolant inside the engine. Now there's a number of sealing surfaces and surfaces that need to basically make sure that they're not leaking in order for your cooling system to function correctly. One of those namely is the radiator, making sure there's no leaks in the radiator, any hoses that are connecting the radiator to the engine all the way to the heater core. And then also remember the head gasket is actually sealing the combustion chamber from the cooling passages and the cooling passages from the oil passages. There could be a leak between the oil passages and the cooling passages that actually has no effect on the combustion chamber, therefore it would yield a perfect compression test if you were to test the compression. So this is a really easy tool to use. Basically you just hand pump this up. Um, you're going to build up pressure like would normally be in the system, probably around 15 to 25 psi. And then what you're going to do is you're going to listen and look around the car to see if you have any little bubbles coming out, if you hear any hissing, anything that seems subnormal. Uh, the benefit of this is you're able to pressurize the cooling system without having the engine run. So you can really be spot on with the diagnosis by listening to what's going on without having a clicking engine right next to you making it really distracting and hard to hear. 
All right, so when you pressurize your cooling system, there's going to be a number of things you're going to want to check. First being just the hoses in general. If you move these around, we move this one around, we had a little bit of bubbling here, knowing that we don't have 100% seal here. Uh, luckily, it's not that critical on this car, but that's something we did notice. You're going to feel around the radiator, feel the hoses, make sure they're good. Now, one place that people often forget is go inside the car and put your head around the dashboard of the car and make sure you're not leaking anything or hearing any hissing around the heater core on the car because that is linked into your cooling system and can be quite a common failure item on these cars. Now, if you're concerned about a head gasket, what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna pull the dipstick out and put your ear up to it. If you hear a little bit of hissing, like there's basically the pressure from here is going into the crankcase of the engine and pressurizing it. Also, you can notice that by pulling off the oil cap and just putting your ear up to that, and if you hear a little bit of hissing there, that will lead me to think that there is a failure in the head gasket between the cooling passages and the oil passages, basically allowing that pressure that we put in the cooling system to escape into the oiling system of the engine. So we hope this video helped you understand what can happen when your car overheats. Now, obviously, we diagnose this as a head gasket. There could be other things, and always remember that the cause and the effect are different. Different. The reason your car may overheat is not necessarily the head gasket, that is the effect of the overheating process. Now, if you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. If there's any other Diag videos that you want to see, please leave them in the comments below. And as always, we'll catch you on the next one.